Uh, so this is, first of all, a good afternoon to all the members of the media and uh, to uh, colleagues, uh, Bill Garrity from uh, UHP, the University Health Professionals at, uh, at UConn Health Center, and to all of the members of 1199 UHP and the AAUP uh, who are joining this press conference. I'm Rob Burrill, I'm the president of 1199 SEIU. Uh, we represent about 25,000 healthcare work workers across the state, but uh, 6,000 state employees. And so today's press conference is, is really a, a, a gathering of state employees who have, in addition to other parts of the healthcare, various parts of the healthcare sectors, uh, have just performed heroically uh, in the past several weeks on, in the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I, I think that one of the hallmarks of people who go into healthcare uh, in any sector, public, private, public. Did they do uh, by a passion uh, for taking care of people, uh, a love of uh, comforting and, and healing others. Uh, and that certainly has been the case uh, during this crisis. You know, when, when things get difficult, uh, I think nobody more than healthcare providers um, knows what it is to really come across, uh, come together across differences um, and find ways of, of caring for one another, supporting one another, confronting challenges, uh, and to make things better uh, for uh, themselves as uh, each other as coworkers and of course for their patients. And to do that, of course, uh, regardless of uh, ability, of uh, background, of race, of gender, uh, and we've been seeing all of those just, uh, you know, really tremendous and courageous uh, and compassionate human qualities from uh, healthcare workers across the state of Connecticut, but public sector workers, uh, especially uh, uh, in, in the past uh, several weeks. Um, that being said, there's also been tremendous pain and tremendous suffering uh, that has been taking place. Uh, you know, amongst healthcare professionals and amongst uh, uh, the people that they take care of, who in many cases, uh, healthcare workers really become a part of their families um, and, and the, the people the healthcare workers are close to. Just to give people a, a sense of the scale of, uh, of, of challenge that healthcare workers have been uh, confronting over the past several weeks. Within DEMIS, um, 43 uh, staff have tested positive for COVID-19 in the past patients in corrections 356 staff uh, have tested positive for COVID-19 uh, 471 inmates including 99 uh, just at one facility DCI and there have been six inmate fatalities uh, within DDS 122 staff people have tested positive for COVID-19 at UConn Health Center uh, just just one hospital uh, the state's public hospital in Farmington 73 work have tested positive. Uh, within 1199, we know of uh, three fatalities uh, that have taken place. Um, Marlene Thompson, who was a program supervisor, 35 years at Southbury Training School. Patrick Brellis, uh, developmental services worker, also at Southbury Training School, 34 years. And Michael Mark, a developmental services worker at Southbury Training School, 27 years there. Uh, in addition, we know of a number of uh, fatalities that have taken place of, of clients uh, within DDS, uh, especially. Uh, and lastly, uh, perhaps most tragically, um, a, a number of family members of state employees who contracted the virus uh, from their loved ones who got sick at work uh, have also passed away due to COVID-19. So, um, you know, all of us, I think, uh, across the country, but especially our frontline essential healthcare workers uh, are at a place where you know, people are, are uh, very much feeling uh, pain, uh, grief uh, that goes beyond just the physical uh, illness, um, but, but also the loss of losing uh, clients, coworkers, um, and in some cases, family members, you know, people that we love and care about. Uh, so I think we'll just start with just a, a brief moment of silence to, uh, to, to observe uh, that, that, that uh, grief that we're experiencing collectively. Okay. Uh, we, we have a speaking program today, which is really offering an, an opportunity to, to raise up the voices of uh, frontline healthcare workers who can talk about what they've experienced, what it's been like to uh, going to work in an environment where, uh, you, know, you know, based on your profession, you were called to 
uh, to, to care for people who have a pathogen that can you know, potentially uh, you know, be fatal for you and, and for those that you care about. Uh, I think it's, it's incredibly uh, important as the state is confronting challenges, including budgetary challenges, uh, that, we, that we think about and we, we consider uh, the, the voices of the frontline workers who've been the glue that have held our society together, have taken every risk and made every sacrifice over the past several weeks. We're going to start with Mark Canestrari, who is a developmental services worker at Southbury Training School, where he's been for. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Canestrari. I work at currently been redeployed to Southbury Training School. Uh, I've been uh, in the field uh, in the field of developmental disabilities and, and um, mental health for over 30 years. I have a background in nursing and psychology. Uh, spent the last 10 years working for the department in the capacity of a respite care uh, employee working with uh, approximately 150 different families providing care to, to their loved ones at uh, Spruce Brook Respite Center in Southbury. Um, most recently at the beginning of April, I was uh, received a call and was uh, involuntarily redeployed to Southbury Training School uh, to a cottage where prior to my arrival there was uh, two positive cases, one uh, staff and one client um, that I was unaware of and, and upon arrival found out about. Um, although I was involuntary, I think it's important for me to know, although I was involuntarily displaced or redeployed, I'm committed to the people I care for, the people I serve, regardless of where I am doing that, whether it be in respite care or public services. Um, so I, I have not missed um, a day of work since that redeployment. Um, during such the first week, several cases of COVID had become, uh, we, become, we became aware of. And within a week of my redeployment, they actually shut the cottage down and an, and an opportunity to uh, increase social distancing, increase the safety and security for our individuals and our staff by giving people more room so that you know we didn't spread this virus that as we all know can be potentially uh, uh, deadly and, and really, uh, you know, is non-discriminatory. Uh, so, um, and then two weeks after my redeployment, I was again redeployed to the all COVID uh, cottage that uh, where we provided uh, care to those individuals that were positive. Um, with the clients that we care for, quite often things like social distancing and, you know, even things like proper hand washing and so on is just beyond their understanding. So, you know, we, and to properly care for individuals, there's no way to, to, you can't social distance and care for somebody with special needs that needs help with say eating and, and, and you know, bathing and toothbrushing, et cetera. Um, so we did the best with what we, I can tell you in the four weeks that I've been redeployed or four, actually over four weeks now, uh, I was only um, given one N95 mask during that time frame. And, and the other things that we do or I've done in my capacity there is to apply and remove um, uh, treatments for um, nebulizer treatments, which really does call for that type of protection as it aerosolizes, um, you know, puts the potentially puts that virus into the air. And, you know, even without that, the proper equipment, and, and we did the best, I've done the best I could. And, and I'd like to think um, to the benefit of those that I care for, but also my family and friends and anybody that I, and I've had to really kind of keep myself limited to where I go and, and who I come in contact with as a result that I could potentially be a carrier and, and be asymptomatic. And, you know, certainly this has been a stressful time, um, as I'm sure it has been for many of, for all Americans, let alone uh, those of us that are in healthcare. Um, I can tell you that, you know, in the 30 years, 30 plus years in this field, I never once went to work thinking, you know, today I potentially could die or, or in, you know, contract something that could kill me or even worse, hurt or kill or, or or infect my family members or those that I love and I hold dearest. Uh, so it's been it's been tough, um, but I'm absolutely committed to to providing quality care to those that 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 need it, um, whether it be again in respite care or at the training school. Um, we have lost a couple of individuals that we care for um, in the cottage that I was originally redeployed to um, during this time. Um, 
and it, it's although I didn't know them well, it's it's a loss. Um, and I and I I did not know the individuals that the staff that that have passed and their family members. Uh, my heart goes out to them. My prayers go out to them. And and I um, I don't know what else to say. I would do it again. You know, if this crops up again in the fall, and I need to be redeployed, I'll I'll do the best I can to to provide the care that I know that our individuals deserve and need. Um, I don't know that I have really much else to add, but uh, thanks for listening. Mark, thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Lenise Robinson, who's a developmental services worker, uh, also at Southbury Training School, where he's been for 27 years. Uh, how you doing? My name is uh, Lenise Robinson. I've been at Southbury, like he was just saying, you know, Southbury Training School for 27 years, but I'm also a union delegate out here. And I have to say, I am so impressed with my coworkers because during this time, you would think that people would be calling out, people would be staying home sick, but mandatory has not jumped through the roof at all. Um, the overtime hasn't spiked. Everyone is coming to work because this is, is what we'd love to do. We'd love to take care of our guys that we have come to know, and we, we, we view them as our family. But that being said, you know, we are in this predicament where we have to come in here and we're taking care of the guys that we care about, the ladies that we care about. But in the back of our minds, we're saying, you know, this is something that has proven to, to, to kill people. Um, we have, that I know personally, three coworkers that have died, one I'm really close to, and he was a healthy person. So for, you know, this, him to get infected with this and, and, and now he's gone, I, I just have, I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around it um, because this is something that may not uh, take me out, but I may bring home to a family member or, you know, to someone that, that, I, that is close to me. And I have to, I have to, you know, wrap my mind around that every single day because not only did we lose coworkers to this, but they lost family to this. And that's something that we just have to always be mindful of. And it's something that we never had to think of before. So when saying that, you know, when I'm thinking about these things, I have to look at the state and wonder why they would even think about coming to us to take anything from us. You know, at this point in time, and we're dealing with this, I just, I don't know, I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around it with what we're dealing with and we're care every day, we're making sure that we take care of those that are the most vulnerable and in the most need of our care. I just, I don't know, I'm having a, a, a really hard time understanding that. And I, I have to say that at Southbury, I think that we are in a unique position because our, our, our director has really, it took him a second to get on board, but since he's got on board, he has really, really been in our corner um, once a week meeting with us, making sure that we have everything we need. And if we need more, it's just a request away. But the state as a whole, I, don't, I think that they are really, they're not valuing the direct care workers that work for the state in doing, coming to work every single day, doing what we have, what we have to do, putting ourselves and our family at risk. I just don't understand how they're not seeing our value. Let, let us thank you for, for obviously your, your work and your service. Uh, you know, again, everyone on this call has really performed heroically. Uh, you know, as, as a uh, Demas, uh, BDS, you know, Yukon Health Center has the option to socially distance. Uh, by the nature of the jobs that they're asked to perform as, as state employees, as health workers, uh, they are putting themselves in harm way, harm's way. Uh, as Lennis uh, talked about, as Mark talked about, they're doing that with full knowledge that uh, they can be harmed and that their family members can be harmed. Um, so when you know, we as, as a, a union are, are see that the Senate Republican leadership is asking for concessions uh, from state employees, you know, just what Lennis talked about, it's incredibly shocking. 
because uh, the, again, th those who are on this call who do not have the option to socially distance, who are called to, uh, to care for others uh, and who are encountering that risk uh, are doing that. And all that we are asking is that the, you know, the, the, the folks in, in the state uh, who are the wealthiest uh, you know, uh, be asked to contribute before uh, anything is cut from state workers. We're going to hear next from Shirley Watson, who's a licensed clinical social, social worker in the Department of Corrections with 22 years of state service. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Um, you can hear me? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, again, oh, thanks. My name is Shirley Watson. I'm a clinical social worker uh, at McDougal Walker uh, in Suffield, which is a um, maximum security facility that houses uh, adult males. And um, uh, it's tough walking in there. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Uh, just by virtue of being incarcerated, it's already got its uh, hazardous circumstances and uh, this pandemic has just made it uh, that much worse. Um, just a little bit of a history, we've actually been advocating for staff uh, for quite some time now and uh, walking into the facilities now, it's like you're doing the work of two, three people and um, it's, uh, it's difficult, but we're essential employees. Um, and we do this work because we love it, because we want to be helpful. We want to be able to make some sort of difference. Uh, in particular in corrections, you know, uh, we, we give voice to the, the voiceless, to the marginalized and disenfranchised. And um, we want to be able to perform the best work that we can. It's just been made difficult uh, with the continued low staffing as well as the pandemic. And if I can just kind of give a little bit of a, a story that just happened is um, uh, I went into work um, and I go in, I cover my units, I make sure I talk to everybody. And uh, one of the uh, guys, you know, was speaking to me and threw a mask and I have my mask on and he's asking me about what it's like being in the world I mean, that's how kind of removed uh, folks are. So he's asking me about how it is in the world because his family's out there uh, and he's worried about them, but he's also wor worried about himself knowing the numbers of staff as well as other inmates that have uh, tested positive. And I'm talking to him and I've got the same concern. I've got the same concern about my family and about myself. And it was such a helpless feeling it was so helpless knowing that my job is to go in and be helpful. And I have the same exact concerns that this, uh, this man did. And uh, that's really what I wanna put across. I'm an essential worker. I go in, I do my job. When I cover, when I walk through that threshold, there's always the chance that I'm walking out and I'm sick. And then I'm going home and my family's getting sick. Um, but uh, I still cross that threshold because uh, I'm a healthcare provider. Uh, I love what I do. I have no intention of walking away from it simply because of uh, the extreme circumstances that we are in right now. So um, I just kind of wanted to give my, uh, my, my story about um, how this uh, has affected not just me, but the people that I serve, the people that uh, I work with and the people that I serve, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Again, thank you, Shirley, for your, your professionalism and, and your, your dedication and the care that you give the, the DOC inmates. Um, next, we have Dr. Teresa Porter, who's a psychologist at Connecticut Valley Hospital. She's been there for 12 years. Good afternoon. Um, I just want to say that before this pandemic, the public services here in Connecticut were already underfunded and understaffed. The pandemic's just laid bare the problems we all knew about. It's made it obvious that the state can't function without the fully funded public sector to shore up the economic infrastructure when the private sector fails. The hospital I work at, CVH, has been so underfunded and understaffed during the last few years that basic programs have been cut back. We frequently don't have enough workers to escort our residents to group treatment rooms within the hospital. 
and medical appointments have had to be canceled at times simply due to lack of staff to escort the residents to a different building or off grounds. The situation has just been worsened by the pandemic. We have ex severe staffing shortages. We have a skeleton crew left. There's not always enough employees here to cover every shift, so staff are working doubles, so staff are getting exhausted. There's not always enough nursing staff to sit with our sick residents and help drink fluids in order to prevent dehydration or staff immediately available to the sick residents to assist them to the bathroom when they're too weak to walk without help. Um, besides the staffing shortages, we're still struggling to ensure our employees have enough PPEs, enough supplies when they're working with folks infected by the coronavirus. Yesterday, one of the women working with an infected patient could not obtain an N95 respirator. Today, several staff told me that they were working with quarantined patients, patients who were infected, but they couldn't get gowns or face shields. Now, on a personal note, I work in the Jerry Psych building, which is similar to a nursing home. The majority of the residents I work with have been infected. One of my residents who I've worked closely with for years has passed away. The majority of my regular staff I work with have been infected and they are out with this virus. And despite all this, my fellow staff and I, the ones who are not sick, we still come in every day. We're working with our non-infected patients. We're working with our infected patients. So rather than considering any cuts to public services like DMS, Connecticut seems like it needs to significantly increase our funding. Um, we need to get our patients through the pandemic, but we also need them to have a chance to recover from the psychiatric illnesses that brought them here to CVH in the first place. Thank you for your time. Dr. Porter, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Bill Garrity, who's the president of UHP Local 3837. He's a registered nurse at Yukon Health Center, and he's been a state worker for 24 years. Thanks, Rob, and thank you everybody for coming and hearing us today. Um, like I said, I am the president of UHP. I was elected out of the bargaining unit about four years ago. I did 16 years bone marrow transplant and oncology. Uh, at UConn Health, and then another five years in the emergency room before I became the president of UHP. Um, I have been, I hate to say, you know, everywhere through this, but that's pretty much the way this feels. Uh, UHP has uh, about 2,800 members in 156 job titles, all at uh, UConn Health. Uh, we cover pretty much everything except uh, uh, the doctors when it comes to the professionals. Um, and one of the things I want to say to you is if you don't trust the politicians, at least listen to the healthcare professionals, our agenda is only to keep the population safe and healthy. You know, nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, radiology techs, researchers, and all the others you're calling heroes, you know, a lot of them are actually state employees that in the very next breath are being attacked. You know, we want, we also, we just want to keep you safe. We want to provide the best care we can, and we want to be able to go home to our families. Uh, I know you like hearing stories, so I want to give you the stories that, you know, are happening on a daily basis. Our nurses right now are being asked or forced to work additional days. We're talking between 60 to 70 hours a week. Um, this, is a, this is a game of attrition right now is what we're playing and we're losing. Uh, we're trying to keep everybody safe as best we can, but when you go ahead and end up having a patient come in and you believe that this person is COVID negative, ends up becoming COVID positive, then you start losing the nurses that were caring for this patient on clean COVID floors or, or floors that didn't have COVID. Um, the patient ends up getting moved to a COVID positive floor, but then you have to start uh, um, quarantining nurses. You know, this is a, this is an, unsustainable model right now. So when we're trying to tell you it is not the time to reopen, we're telling you it's not the time to reopen. We cannot handle those type of numbers. At present time, UConn Health, um, our, our ICU was full. 
you know, we're talking about, uh, and the next move is to go to our, um, our surge ICUs. So those are very important things for you to know. Next up, um, we have families at UConn Health where both parents um, are nurses. You know, I have uh, one family that I think of uh, very closely. They're good friends of mine. Uh, the husband is a nurse who works on our intermediate unit, unit and the nurse, uh, the, the, the wife is a nurse who works uh, in our ICU. So both are critical care nurses. And the two of them actually had to separate just in case one got sick and one didn't. One was actually put, in, put up in a hospital, I'm sorry, in a, in a hotel. Um, and don't you know it, he ended up getting sick. He ended up COVID positive. Um, as Rob said earlier, we have uh, at present time 73 um, hospital workers that are COVID positive. UHP actually has about 53 of them. Um, and again, uh, even workers comp is being denied for these people. These are people who are nurses on the front lines who are, are having this denied and having some of these fights with um, our state and with our, with our hospitals uh, is just not where we need to be right now. We need to do everything we can to protect the population, protect our employees, and do everything we can to try and minimize all of this that's going on. The last thing I wanna say here is healthcare and mental health is going to need to be looked at at long term when this is finished. You know, we're gonna have a new problem with, you know, PTSD when it comes to this. This is a scary, scary thought for a lot of people who are doing this job. Um, I wanna say thank you again for listening and remember UConn Health is our only public hospital. This is what we do. All right, thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Bill. And uh, last, we have Dr. Christopher Steele, who's a primary care physician at UConn Health Center. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Steele or Chris Steele. Um, I'm both an inpatient uh, medicine provider and also a primary care provider. Um, I'm one of the people that's on the front lines for COVID right now. Um, for the last month and a half, I've actually been primarily um, in charge of a or not in charge of, but one of the physicians that runs the inpatient part of the COVID unit. So I've seen this first line. Um, I kind of want to start by thanking everyone. Um, I think everyone here that's really put into the mission, um, like you guys are the reason why our state's in such a, is as good a position as it is now. And it's a lot of this selfless sacrifice that a lot of people are putting through. Um, a little bit about me is I was a student here, uh, MD, MPH student, and um, one of the reasons why I came back here after my training is because it was just how impressed I was with the mission that we were the public hospital, we were the people, we were, are the providers that are going to go out there and give to people that don't have what we, what others have, um, and I think that's a huge powerful message, and I think it's really coming forth after this COVID pandemic. Um, when our, my story ended up happening was is that I started outpatient, the COVID pandemic occurred, and then people asked for volunteers. Um, and as a result of that, I actually volunteered myself to um, be on the front lines. Um, and I'll speak on both realms, uh, both inpatient and outpatient. Um, so in the inpatient world where I've been, it's, it's been hard. I mean, you, you see patients scared, um, you see providers scared. I mean, I can tell you how many times when I do my shift, um, you come in, someone's not there, and you hear that they got sick or they're quarantined. Um, and it's hard, um, but I can tell you this, I've never have been so proud of people that come to work and my own colleagues that actually sit there and they say, you know what, this is my duty to take care of everyone and this is what I'm going to do. I can't tell you how often that we as a group chat to try to figure out ways we can improve our health care, um, how much that, you know, my colleagues and myself spend with supporting each other mentally. Um, I, I just, it's just amazing how well people are banding together um, at this institution as well too. Um, from the outpatient perspective, I think the thing that's important to note too is we are the public hospital, but we are the one that all the Medicaid patients basically in this area can see. I mean, there's a few other clinics, but we are the one that are helping the most vulnerable through this situation. Um, and our clinics have done anything, if not more. I mean, they're taking on extra hours, they're taking on more call, they're doing the COVID center or call center where they're actually taking phone calls from patients. Um, providers are covering each other as some of us like myself are inpatient um, 
helping with the COVID pandemic. And other people have risen in other ways, like as other people have mentioned, the uh, social determinant health issues. So things like homelessness, access to food and so forth and job, you know, um, home and inability to get a job. Like those are things that are popping up more and more. And there's people like Bruce Gould, who's actually mobilized some of our medical students to start calling our patients back and saying, hey, we put you in quarantine. How are you doing? Oh, other things, too, is we also put you, you know, in quarantine. Do you have any of these issues coming about? And we're trying to help address them. And it's something that I even, you know, as a couple of med students that actually approached me too, we have a program called University of Connecticut Health um, Partners, where, where we actually use, we're, we're health leaders, where we actually go about addressing some of these social determinant health issues and through using pre-professional health students, which is going to be more apparent over the summer when people are really going to be scrounging for resources. And it's just amazing that the group of people have come together. Um, I, I think the other thing that I have to say too is, is the community has been great too. They've created PPE. We have face shields, something that we didn't have in the beginning and UConn together has done that, which has just been amazing. And foremost, I think the thing that we always forget is, is like the staff. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into the unit and I see some of these nurses, nurses aides, lab techs and so forth. And they, you know, they look so, you know, they look tired, fatigued. Um, most of us are working 12 hour days, getting a few days off here and there um, straight. And you ask them, you're like, you know, how are you doing? They're like, I'm tired, but you know, I, I feel purpose, you know, and I, I, I gotta say someone like myself, I have three kids, one's six, one's two, and one's eight months. And, you know, I think we are scared. I mean, I, every single day wonder if I'm going to come home and bring something that could potentially harm my loved ones. But I'll be honest with you, the thing that we have to do as a group and as a community is we have to support one another and we have to go forth and we have to actually say, what is, why did we go into these fields? And we're getting tested right now. And our test is, is to be the strength when other people need us. Um, so I really think everyone here, I think all the support we are getting, I really hope if anything possible, to get as much support as we can because our patients are gonna need us more than to pass this COVID pandemic. It's gonna be months to months to months of recovery from all this going on. So thank you so much. Again, th thanks to all of you who really are the, the heroes of, of this crisis. So you hit on so many points, much more uh, articulately and, and from lived experience than I could. But uh, some of what we heard was that, you know, that there, there is a need, uh, given the pandemic, given the recession, given both the, the physical and emotional and mental health needs that people are experiencing right now for not a, a cutting of services, but an expansion of services. Not a reduction in funding, but a, but a, a supplement in, in terms of significant funding uh, for public health services. So uh, we, we are hoping that that's the direction that the state uh, will head in to really rebuild the public, public health infrastructure uh, that we deserve in the wealthiest state, in the wealthiest country in the world. We'll open it up for any questions. Sorry, who's speaking here? Of the 72 hour policy. Um, Katie Traver, I think you got to mute yourself. Are there any questions from the media? Uh, we're not hearing anything. Um, yeah, I, I actually had a question from Hearst Connecticut Media, if, if no one else can jump in. Um, I guess with um, with the state looking at reopening it on May 20th, what does that feel too too soon, I guess, is, is the big question. Does that, do, do any of the healthcare workers want to weigh in on, does that feel like the state's rushing towards this? Or, I mean, we still see positive cases coming up every day. 
So are they concerned about that? And, um, and if anyone wants to speak specifically towards, uh, you know, the elderly population or nursing homes, that would be a huge help. I guess I can try to speak on that. Um, so uh, this is Dr. Steele discussing. Um, I think it's tough, right? So I think the balance that everyone's kind of going forth is at some point we do have to reopen, but there might be the risk that by reopening people will get sick. Um, I think that what you have to do, and I think a lot of it will also be week by week, and that's what I think we're gonna approach it as, and what's what we've been doing, is see where trends of sickness go. And if it increases extensively, say in the next week or two, we may not reopen, right? But if it keeps going down, I think if we are to reopen, what I'd recommend strongly is that people continue to do the proper things like wear face masks out in public, try not to go crazy and, you know, aggregate right away and, you know, keep it, be cautious because you don't know. Um, you, you don't know if, if things reopen and people don't follow the same protective measures they have been doing, they may, you know, spread illness too. Because I think that's the fear that a lot of us have. Um, but I think you have to balance it out. So I don't, I don't know if there's a good answer for either because I've heard a lot of people say, hey, I need to get back to work or I'm going to not have, be able to provide for my family. So I, I, I get that. I understand that there's that fine balance of when do we go back to work or, or when we start resuming things or not. And I think the thing that has to be done is doing it safely. And that's what I'd recommend. Um, in regards to the nursing homes, and I might have someone else to speak on this in regards to, is I think the same thing is, is that what we've been doing is, in, you know, keep encouraging and in giving people PPE, um, the second providers or anyone has any symptoms for COVID, we test immediately. There's been a lot of nursing homes and places, um, well, short-term rehabs that have started opening up COVID-only units, and I think that was what you're going to start seeing. Um, people are getting shifted towards if they are sick, so they segregate the, the homes out there. Um, and a lot of it is, is, I think the nature of this disease is it takes, you know, a, a week from when you get, you contract the illness to get symptoms, in some cases even longer. So it's hard to say, oh, this person's sick or that person's sick right away. Like other illnesses can, you know, show symptoms much quicker. So I think you will start, you know, you may or may not still see people getting sick at some of these higher risk places like prisons, uh, jail systems and uh, nursing homes. Um, but I think doing whatever you can and keeping protection in place is probably your best bet, which is what we're doing right now. Well, what, what I can say in terms of the, the reopening question is that, you know, as, as a union representing all sectors of, of the healthcare workforce across Connecticut, uh, nursing homes in particular, uh, what we really need is a, a engagement with the state that is beyond the sort of 24 to 48 hour crisis period, uh, but looking across sectors to have an integrated plan uh, on, on how to reopen most effectively. Uh, the hands-on caregivers, state employees, hospital workers, nursing home workers, home care workers, group home workers, all face challenges that are unique. And we need to be able to look prospectively outward a month, three months, six months, 12 months, because know that this, the, the impact of this pandemic is going, to be, is going to continue to be felt uh, for quite some time. And so far, we have not been able to have that type of a, a medium and long-term uh, planning engagement uh, with the state of Connecticut. So we certainly uh, hope that that happens. Peter, I'd like to add something real quickly, if I could. Uh, Bill Garrity, UHP. Um, Remember when all of this started, one of the things we were talking about was, you know, depressing the curve so we did not overwhelm our healthcare workers and, and our emergency rooms and ICUs. Again, as I said earlier, this is a game of attrition right now, and we may not be winning this game. We're talking about in the emergency, I'm sorry, in the ICUs, we're talking it takes sometimes four nurses to handle one COVID patient. You know, we're talking when you're talking about turning and proning. Uh, these are things that you guys don't have the opportunity to see that is going on. Um, so may, maybe in my opinion, the May 20th may be too soon. Um, I wish I had better answers. I wish I had the crystal ball that no one actually does have. But again, remember what we did, where we did it, and why we did it. It was because of not overwhelming the system. And coming back too soon is going to overwhelm the system. One of my favorite memes right now is, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, the parachute slowed us down, so okay, we can take it off while we're not on the ground yet. We're not on the ground yet. 
we're not ready to stop yet, my opinion. Any other questions from the media on the call? Uh, hi, Pedro. I had uh, two different ones. Um, I was curious um, if any of the people who work at Southbury have a sense of uh, how many clients have died from there of COVID. And I also wanted to ask Dr. Porter um, pretty much the same question. Uh, how many have died at the hospital and have there been more people that have been brought into CVH since this started as uh, patients or, or, or not? Hi, this is uh, Linus from Southbury Training School. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the number that of, uh, of clients that we've lost due to uh, the COVID. I know it's a very low number within the, the single digits and pretty much goes the same for uh, total infections. It's, it's quite a bit below 20. So we're doing pretty good here um, because of a lot of the uh, protect, protections that have been put in place. And uh, like I said, you know, previously, our director was, was he's been really good in, uh, in, in, in foresight and in, in working with the union to make sure that we kept this uh, whole thing contained. Mark Canisteri, uh, again, currently redeployed to Southbury Training School. Thank you, Lennis, for that. Um, I also want to make a, a, a point of, you know, mentioning those folks that did actually voluntarily, they chose to go and work in the COVID unit, which I got to give them credit. I mean, I, as I said, I was involuntarily placed there and I felt the, committed to, to be there and to do the best job that I could. But there was at least four people that I, I know of that, that volunteer to, to do that, to put themselves and their family at risk and, and, and knowingly that, that this could potentially be fatal. And then on top of that, I'd like to say that, you know, um, uh, the private sector has been great as well. I happened to uh, speak with somebody from uh, Amphenol who, uh, who was very kind enough to, to donate 250 uh, KN95 masks to uh, our unit there, the COVID unit. And I thought that was a very kind gesture. And then uh, to, to everyone's point, I think it, this is really a team effort. And, uh, you know, we, if we work together um, to, to do the best we can now and prepare ourselves, you know, to do the best job now, but also to prepare ourselves for the future, whether that means opening on the 20th uh, or not, uh, that I don't have an answer for. I think certainly if we're gonna, whenever we open, uh, reopen that it should be done slowly and carefully and it should be done with uh, you know scientifically you know we should continue to monitor the this the the cases and hospitalizations and deaths and all those uh, statistics that we've been looking at um, and and adjust accordingly I know this has not only been a uh, for you know it's not only been a, a health concern but a, a, f a financial concern for many people not only in the state of Connecticut but across the, the US and the world. And I get that people want to get back to work. I just don't want it to be to the detriment of them, of their of their health or the health of their family and, and the rest of us. So uh, I wish I, I knew, like I like uh, one of our speakers had said, like Bill had said, I don't have a crystal ball either. So um, anyway, I think it was Bill who said it. And it it's, uh, it's, we'll wait and see and hopefully we'll all, we'll all get through this together. Dr. Porter, Dr. I, I wonder... Hi there, ahead, I can answer for you. Um, so yeah, I actually, we had one death here at CVH. It was a gentleman with whom I worked for several years. We have a building that has 45 geriatric psychiatric beds plus 15 for folks who've got traumatic brain injury. So this is in some way CVH's or the state of Connecticut's nursing home, if you will. Um, and we unfortunately, despite the best efforts of everyone, we ended up with 13 of our 15 folks on one unit contracting the virus. And we lost one resident. Um, it's been very hard for us because we're, we see what's happening in the public nursing homes. We see what's happening in other places. And we're terrified that our 
frail population are at risk. Um, so we have been asking for everything and we're coming at any conversations with our management here um, with a focus on the real vulnerability of our people. You also asked about admissions. Um, we have psychiatric and we have substance abuse buildings. I believe, I'm not involved in admissions, I believe that admissions to the psychiatric buildings slowed down and then stopped pretty soon after the lockdown. I think for the detox and um, addictions building, because of the medical necessity of that, I think that was a slower um, ending. I don't believe we're still taking any admissions. They may at times need to um, because of placement issues, but I believe because of the different nature of that disorder, it had a slightly slower um, termination of the admission process. Does that help? Thank you very much. You're welcome. And in corrections, I know there have been six inmate fatalities, surely. Any other questions from media members on the line? Hi, my name is um, Daniela Donsell. I'm with WTIC News. Um, obviously, we can't speak for the state and, and none of us were ready for, for this pandemic to really hit us. But there is talk about a second wave possibly hitting in the fall. And I'm just wondering if anyone would want to comment about whether healthcare workers are prepared for a second wave, considering, you know, we had the, this experience with this first wave. If a second wave does hit us, do any of you feel prepared for that? Anybody want to volunteer to answer that question? Um, yeah, again, this is uh, Linus from Southbury Training School. Um, I don't, I don't truthfully think this is anything that you, that that you can prepare for because there's there's so much stuff that's unknown out there. But um, I do think that us as healthcare workers, we wouldn't be in this field if we didn't love it. So, you know, whatever it takes, we're gonna have to do what we have to do to be there for our for the ladies and gentlemen that uh, that we care for. So, are we prepared? Um, being prepared as far as equipment is one thing, but being prepared to step up and do what you have to do, I think that we've already shown that. And if it were to come back again, we're going to continue to show that we, you know, we're prepared to be there. Um, I know, Shirley, you wanted, you wanted to get in. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, uh, in regard to your question, I think a, a, a key part of this is the vicarious trauma that healthcare care workers are experiencing with this first wave. So, you know, to just to, to tie in, if in fact the uh, state opens, reopens uh, in the near, near future, um, we have to be prepared to take care of the mental health of uh, the healthcare professionals who went through the first wave because we're going to have to go through the second wave. And I think that that's, that's key is that we put supports in place so that we can be very, so we can be taken care of so that we can go back during the second wave and take care of the people that we need to take care of. So I think, it, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna be, it'll be difficult, no doubt about it. But, you know, certainly we need, uh, you know, more protective, um, gear, we need more PPEs. We certainly need uh, resources in order to make sure that we can take care of the people uh, that we're going to, that we're taking care of now and that we will be taking care of in the future. Because this will have, this will, this will trend in the fall. I mean, let's just be real about that. But, um, but yeah, 
So if we get the PPEs and we get the resources now, we can be in a better position to take care of the people that we're going to have to take care of in late, later on down the road. Thank you. This is Dr. Porter. I'm just going to chime in, if I may. There's when I travel, when I'm on an airline, I watch the flight crew tell us that before anyone puts a mask on the vulnerable person they're traveling with, they should put their own mask on. And I think that analogy is going to be true for the physical and mental health of all of our workers. As Shirley said, this is causing a degree of trauma. We're having deaths. We're having um, questions of our own health and what we are bringing back to our own families. I'm working on a COVID unit with staff who I make them take time every day to talk to me, to see how they're holding up, to talk about nightmares and trouble sleeping and appetite changes and all those sort of things. We will need to find a way to make sure our metaphorical masks are on first as well as our PPEs before we can start the next round. And, and one of the things which, which I think that uh, many, many of you are, 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 have referenced in the past is, uh, you know, just we've needed for a number of years to expand services in terms of public health infrastructure in the state. We have critical short staffing needs in DEMIS, in uh, DDS, in a number of state agencies that pre-exist the COVID-19 crisis. And so now more than ever, we need to make sure that, that you know, as we're facing the pandemic, uh, that we expand services, that we increase staffing, uh, and that we you know, ask uh, the most fortunate of the folks in, in our state. We have 17 billionaires in this state who you know, collectively have about $70 billion in wealth. It's the wealthiest state in the country. Uh, that those folks contribute. Uh, they don't have to risk their lives. They don't have to risk their own health, health members in the way that, that frontline care workers do. Uh, but they can help to contribute to strengthen the social safety net, uh, you know, by making sure that we've got the resources to hire additional staff, buy PPE, uh, et cetera. I kind of want to just chime into it from the healthcare standpoint on the hospital side. I, I think from our standpoint, we'll be, you know, as ready as we can mentally um, come fall. I mean, I, a lot, I've been so impressed by the staff here at UConn Health uh, stepping up, but I think kind of what echo everyone else is saying is a lot of this is going to be standing up on, what the community and what the state of Connecticut is going to do in regards to how to support us for the next wave, uh, meaning things like focus on psychiatric health, uh, focusing on ways to make sure we get adequate PPE for the next wave, and you know campaigns and everything ready to make sure the public's safer and so forth. And I think those are the next step: getting the resources available for deficient areas that have been very deficient in resources going forth. And I think if we're really well prepared and we strengthen our public health sector. I think we will 100% be in a much better position going for the fall. Um, but if we ignore those things, I think, you know, there, it, it, it could be harder the, coming the fall because usually the second wave historically usually is stronger than the first. So I would just, you know, I really want to echo what everyone's saying is, is that I think this is the time where we need everyone to stand up collectively together and be a strong voice in the state of Connecticut and do what's best for our community. So. That's it. I'd like to add one more thing. I want to agree with everything my brothers and sisters have said here. Um, I said it before when we talked about PTSD. The second wave is going to come. We all know this. And this is the responsibility of everybody. It's a personal responsibility to minimize what's going to happen. Every one of us knows this is going to happen. We've been told. I would be very, very happy if I could be the person to stand up and say, Oh my God, I was wrong. Okay, that's what I want to happen. I want to be the one to have to stand up and say I was wrong. Okay, you guys did everything we asked you to do and it didn't happen. That's why we're asking you to do what we're asking you. Like I said, if you don't like the politicians, we understand that. But listen to your doctors and nurses and listen to your healthcare professionals because that's what's going to stop this. Thank you, Chris, for everything you do. <laughs> oh no, thank you guys. You're going to do the right here for us, I feel like. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I, I do so little compared to everyone else that's been, you know, going on this. So I really want to know that. Thank you all so much. Any other questions?
I had one quick follow up. I don't know if that's um, so the governor said on Monday that there's going to be a large shipment of PPE going to nursing homes. But I'm wondering if that's uh, for, from the national stockpile. Are those going to any other um, healthcare agencies or, or healthcare providers? And, and if so, uh, do you know what's included in those supplies? We have not heard firsthand uh, details of, of where all of that uh, shipment is going. We do know that uh, there are some, uh, there is some PE supply that's going out to the Medicaid waiver workforce, which is about 10,000 uh, personal care attendants, um, and where there's been you know, very little PPE distribution to this point in time. Any other questions? Again, that really speaks mind? to the need to have an integrated planning between labor and management around the questions uh, relating to the pandemic and, and, and across uh, different sectors. Of okay, it's 1 p.m. Do we have any other questions or should we call it a day here? All right, well, if you were having trouble with your mute button, uh, feel free to call me and I'll certainly patch you in to some workers and union leaders uh, if, um, if possible. Thank you very much all uh, for taking this call and thank you to all the workers on the front lines. Uh, let's keep fighting. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Tal. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.